for me, it's all about bringing organisations in, getting them through our process and helping them to scale their technology. Right, right. And, and the technology sort of readiness level of our industry, if I can put it like that, you know, we're shifting to electrification, we're hearing about gigafactories, you know, being built, we've got British Vault, uh, we've got the folks up at, at Nissan, um, and I think the ambition is to have, what, three or four more, maybe seven in total potentially? I think I've seen something of that magnitude. How, do, how will you help make that happen, then? you and your team and this facility? Yeah, sure. So, so you're right. Um, Faraday Institution and the APC have been doing a whole load of work on how many, how many we need and how many, how many gigawatt hours of battery production we need in, in the UK right. just to support the automotive industry. And that's something like 90 gigawatt hours by 2030 and 140 gigawatt hours of production by 2035. That's huge, George. At the moment, you, you, you've mentioned, you know, basically we've got one automotive organisation that's been producing um, batteries in the UK, a couple of gigawatt hours a year, basically. So it's a huge way to go. So one of the things is we've been brilliant in the UK at the research stage. Right? Yep. Yeah, so we've been very good in academia and more recently within the Faraday Battery Challenge. Government's brought a whole process together within the Faraday um, Institution which is all about organising academia and ensuring we're looking at the issues that are really a problem, including manuf manufacturing. Right. What, what, where, where we then fit in is you know, what you may call in a small business the valley of death. You take a piece of technology to a certain maturity level and suddenly you can't prove it at production scale to your investors or, or to your OEM customers and you hit a real brick wall. And it's very difficult to raise the cash to put a plant together like this. So UKB is here as that plant, it's open access, um, critically, we're not looking to own any, any foreground IP. Yeah. So anyone who comes and works here scales their technology, they own all that foreground, yes. and that's critical. Yeah. So, so this kind of facility, Roger, it, it kind of exists around the world in other places, but typically only inside the major cell yes. manufacturers. Yes. Um, and so this is about the only place right now you can go that has capability on the scale, it's open access and you don't have to worry about it. Oh, look, look, I, I'm a big fan. As you know, I think I came here maybe the day you started. It was like a year ago, wasn't it? it December was literally a year ago. Yeah, today. yeah, it was. And, and, and then I know it's officially opened uh, uh, in July. I know when I came here, there were like three or four cars in the car park. Now there are people around everywhere, car parks full. You know, it, it just has that sense of real purpose and excitement. And, and I can be a moaning old mini, if I'm honest with you, about government. I guess we all can, can't we, from time to time. But the investment in this facility, and I think what it can catalyse uh, in the regard to what you've explained there, it is so important, really important. We, we should be so proud of what this facility is and what it's going to help us to, de to deliver. Um, can I ask you, I'm going to talk in a bit to one of your colleagues about people, because I think with all the conversation about stuff, you know, battery minerals, you know, the batteries themselves, this whole thing, you know, we can't lose sight of the fact that we need some really capable people, lots of them in truth, um, and, and I'm, I'm keen to understand are there transferable skills from the existing auto industry that can come into this, or are they all going to need to be PhD chemists that know how to, you know, mix a cocktail, um, well, a chemistry <laughs> cocktail, I don't mean, I don't know, there isn't a bar here, is there? <laughs> there isn't. <laughs> But um, yeah, that kind of stuff. So 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 yeah. I mean, how how do you feel now about the plan? What what is your plan? If you kind of quickly encapsulated it. Yeah. Okay. So the, the, from from a year ago, things have moved on a lot. I mean, we didn't even have all of the cell line up and running until September this year. We started to build a pipeline of clients who wanted to come in and use the facility. Um, bit of a bow wave, in fact. So even today, I know you can't go in. You can't really go into the clean, clean and dry room right now. And that's because we've got customers in there. Yes. So we've got several different customers right now today working on their, their um, coating their materials, producing yes. cells, etc. And down in module and pack, we've got a client in building and testing modules um, right. for a piece of work as well. So we have, what, where we found ourselves in the industry, we've proven a point. The industry needs this kind of facility. Customers are kind oh, of clamoring to come along. One of the issues even we've got right now is staffing to be able to deliver on that. So we've currently got 30 job vacancies out. Wow. We're, we're interviewing regularly every day. We're getting some, some good candidates and we're starting to em employ those people. But this is going to be a real issue mm. for the industry. Do you, do you need people who just don't really know much and just hang out on LinkedIn, for example? Would there be a space for someone like that? <laughs> someone with the right kind of knowledge, Roger. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, no, look, I think you've got talented people in every Yes. In the UK. 
And, and what are we looking for? Six or seven? We're looking for seven gigafactories. Around about seven is what yeah. forecast is being needed for right. meeting forecast demand. Right. The bottom box is probably the most important one. It's the standout one in this story. Yes. So the gigafactories might not be in the UK. Right. France wants gigafactories, Germany wants gigafactories, yes, indeed. Norway. Each country wants gigafactories. <laughs> And the UK is competing with all of these countries to be the host for the big factories. Mm. So this, this is interesting, by the way, how big the supply chain proposition is for you know to build this this ecosystem. It is you yeah. know, of it all. Yeah, yeah. But you, you think about the supply chain behind the manufacture of diesel engines and petrol engines. It's huge, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is underneath the OEM. Yes, so and, it's and, a similar and story. I don't want to get ahead of things because you've got a whole story on here, but. But when we're talking about this transition of people from the jobs they do today to the jobs that they could be doing tomorrow, is much of that transferable skill? I mean, I spoke a bit to Adam when we were looking around the facility, um, that there is some of that, but, but, but how would you see that as HR um, I would split jobs into three broad categories. So there are some jobs, take HR as an example, or finance, to get people to work in the gigafactories in those functions. You don't need them to know anything about batteries. Right. Obviously, they'll, they'll get to know the process, they'll get to know that industry, but that's just the same as anybody moving to a new industry. It happens all the time. So no, no real challenge, no real issue. At the other end of the scale, you need people that know what goes inside a battery. Yeah. They need to understand the electrochemistry, they need to understand the you know, mechanical engineering around batteries, battery management systems. So the, these are people that are quite hard to find. So there's definitely a challenge there. Anybody with product knowledge, hard to find. And, and the UK will need to produce more of them. Then you've got the group in the middle. They're the people that have to have process knowledge. So Adam, who you mentioned, is, is a good example. He works on electro manufacturing. He now knows a lot about electro manufacturing. Oh, he d does he ever? He's very smart. He's, he's, yes. he's, in the UK, he's an expert. Yes. When he joined us, he knew nothing about yeah. electro manufacture. Yeah. What, what he had, which is what we, um, what we recruited basically, was experience of working as an engineer in industry, and specifically in Adam's case, he worked in a, a manufacturing process that had some similarities with the electrode manufacturing. So he'd come from a background, basically it was powder metallurgy, so he was working with metal powders, which is the starting point for right. mixing a slurry that he used to make the electrode. And that kind of story applies to many of the processes that mm. we've got in here. So in cell assembly, for instance, it's large volume, high speed equipment. You, you've perhaps been to see it. Yep. Um, you'd see similar kind of manufacturing processes in, in the tobacco industry or, or in any fast moving consumer goods kind of industry. So if we can recruit people from those industries, they've already got really good foundational knowledge. We can build on that. We can show them what you need to do to right. operate our equipment. So there's there's a skills gap, but it's a bridgeable gap. As long as we've got the right number of people, we can draw from those industries. Yes, and, this, and th that's all articulated here. You know, this is this is longer term. Oh, okay. So in the, in the, in the short term, when you're facing the need to ramp up your recruitment quickly, you want to bring on board people that can hit the ground running. Yeah, hands on. Do yes. For your longer term planning, you can recruit people that haven't got the same level of ability as an adult mm. already has. And you can start training apprentices. Mm. So one of the pieces of work that we've been involved in is, is defining the requirements of an apprenticeship framework for people working in battery manufacturing. Mm. So we've taken existing apprenticeship standards, we're not trying to create something from scratch, we're building on something that's already there because that will speed up the process. And we're adding into the requirements specific modules of knowledge, competence and skill that you need to manufacture mm. batteries. And the idea behind that is, is so that anywhere in the UK, so anywhere where there's potentially going to be a gigafactory, trainers, colleges, employers can work on the apprenticeship yeah. standards and develop their own people for the future. Now, now, we're in this extraordinary decade of change. There's no doubt the 2020s, I mean, apart from the business that's been happening with all this mask stuff, yeah. you know, the, the kind of geopolitics, the shift from internal combustion to, to electrification, as you've explained, you know, it, it, it's all happening around us. Now, if I'm at school, you know, whether I've just gone to secondary school or, or whatever, 
whatever school I've gone to, um, given that it's this decade of change and then decades ahead, yeah. what sort of things do you think you would advise if you were, say, a careers teacher at school now, should they be looking at chemistry or, you know, again, thinking of what you said earlier, mechanical engineering, you know, electrical engineering, uh, are these going to be the, the skills that you want to see emerge out of schools and colleges? I, if we were advising young people what subjects to pick at school, now, chemistry would definitely be we're one of the top Right. Ones. Um, we're not cutting bits of metal to make batteries, so yeah. it's about chemistry. Having said that, um, you can have a good career without being a chemist. Um, electrical and electronic engineering is still a really, really useful skill. Mechanical engineering is still a useful skill. Being able to lead and manage people is still a really, really useful skill. And then, of course, there are all the commercial areas and the functional areas, none of which are new. So I think, I think perhaps the only big change is now I would say if you're choosing sciences, you're attracted to physics in the past. Yes. Maybe think about chemistry. Right, right. That right. sounds like great advice. Yeah. Yeah. And, and here's a little, again, a definition of some of what all of those roles are. You mentioned, yeah, these are the roles you mentioned some of them. Yeah, 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 absolutely. This is, this, is, this is what you were just referring to. Yes, yeah, yeah. So this is, this, is, this is all what do we do today. This is all about what do we do in the next few years. And this is, this is the longer term. Yeah. So, you know, what we've been talking about here in terms of skill sets, these are transferable skills. They're, they're people from, from your industry, from, from automotive, from precision engineering, etc., from, from the chemical industry, from, you know, it, it's... So the good news here is in terms of what can the UK offer, and I think this facility and the work that people, uh, for example, um, the Faraday Institution, like to illustrate is you know what's our capability what's our skill set and i think the thing i'm learning in this is definitely we have a huge workforce of highly skilled people to begin with and those skills are transferable into what you've been showing us here now yeah great no that's what great what you actually do is you prepare layers of the different electrodes the separator uh, and create a multi-layer sandwich essentially um, and that's what this tool set is doing it's quite different Obviously, you use the same basic materials, but the electrodes are the same. Yep. Um, and the way that it's uh, put together is really quite different as well. Yes. And, that's, and because these cells are much bigger, then obviously the throughput of these machines is uh, quite a lot lower as well. Right. So this is a, a Z-fold formation. So. Thank you so much, Adam, for taking me around that cell assembly facility. I learned so much. I'd like to thank Jeff and the whole team of the UK Battery Industrialisation Centre for making me so welcome and teaching me, informing me and advising me on this fantastic facility. In particular, I really enjoy talking to Damien and understanding where the people development is going to come. This is such a crucial part of the supply chain. And of course, Ian commercialising this fantastic jewel in the crown of the battery technology ambition here in the United Kingdom. What a wonderful way to end 2021.